trouble on you. If you guys want to know about something, you've heard something once upon a time. Um, I watched the lecture from last week, and you can't really see the uh, the paper that you showed. Do you think you can post that or like see the picture? Yes, I will do that. Yes. Remind me of the other class, so I'll put a note on it. Okay, um, I want to say more about the mixture model. So, uh, for those of you that aren't really initiated, this is clustering. This is what is called clustering. So, this is probabilistic clustering in the way Bayesians do it, but there's really only two things that we do there's breaking up space and stratifying things. So if there was one, you know, I heard this said once upon a time, if there's one important word that statisticians should know, it's stratifying. Pull groups apart where it's appropriate. Don't average over everything, or else you're going to get something that's nonsensical. If things come from a mixture, averaging over everything might tell you what's happening on average, and maybe you can minimize some form of risk, but really you want local control of things. You want to know what's happening locally. If you're in design, some people have called that something like blocking. So when you locally control air. So locally estimating things and understanding how the different groups differ and why they differ, that's the important thing. So I tend to think in every experiment when people are going to try to distinguish groups and say they're different, I already know they're different. It's really a question of why are they different. And so that's what you're trying to figure out. So that's one of the things that we do is we break space up. And the other thing we do is we fit functions to those spaces. So break space, fit regression. So in machine learning, they'll call this supervised and unsupervised learning. For instance, clustering and regression. So supervising something means you have a Y in there. And so unsupervised means you're looking for structure. So there really are only two things. And then there's an infinite number of possibilities that we need to be able to handle. How noisy is the space? How sparse is the space? How well does our method work? Um, I'm going to tell you about something called Dirichlet processes later on. We'll probably uh, run over into the next class. Yeah, I always try to think about, after all the different thesis committees that I sit on, all the different papers I read, what would I like Virginia Tech to know about? And it used to be I wanted them to know about MCMC. Just know what this is, you know, basis theorem, on MCMC, you're in the game. And now 15 years has passed. And so now I want you to understand other things like Cauchy tails. We don't need that normal behavior. How do we change everything and kind of lighten up the normal assumption? We literally heavy up the tails, make the tails fat deal with uncertainty. So you can kind of have like everything's kind of compartmentalized, but every once in a while, if you have an outlier, I really like that term because maybe that's the most important thing. So the most interesting thing. You know, a lot of times we teach people throw stuff away, but I say make your model better. So the Cauchy tail thing. And then mixtures. So I want you guys to know about mixtures, clustering, stuff like that. If you can master kind of both these things where you're like building regression models and kind of controlling the tail behavior and breaking up space appropriately where you think it differs, maybe your algorithm can help you to figure it out. If you can do those two things, you have a career, period. So if you can just do normality stuff, you have a thriving career up to the year 1980. You know? So now things have changed, but normality is kind of a basis for all of that as well. So even in this um, K-finite mixture model, if I wanted to control tail behavior, I could build in that Cauchy thing. And so how do you do all the math? It almost doesn't matter if you know MCMC. You build the algorithm, and it cycles through everything. And the whole thing is, is can you build a simulation study to verify that you've built the right code? And so um, when I talk about Dirichlet processes, I'm not going to refer you to a paper, because most of them are steeped in measure theory. You guys are kind of out of the game instantly. It's like, what does this say? And I'm just going to break down the algorithm. It's actually really easy. So unfortunately for statisticians, we have the curse of trying to be mathematicians. And so it's 
sometimes we start out with that guise and we try to make everything seem much more theoretical than it needs to be. So I'll give you kind of an engineering take on it of just how do you implement this thing. So if you need to use this in your research, you're like, hey, this part of the space is different from that part of the space, and I don't know how many components for the space there are and how many places I need to break the space. The Deerslade process is probably one of the big winners from the last 10 years in, in Bayesian statistics. It's starting to finally catch up to classes. So I'll tell you about this. OK, um, review session on Wednesday, 530. So if you want to talk about homework or implementation details or any of this stuff, I'd love to. Um, I want to just remind you what that K finite mixture model is. I did it with the Gaussian assumption in the example that I was working through. I'm inclined to stick with that for a moment, but you can change that. So the nice thing about Gaussian mixtures is if you have any smooth distribution, even something that's like some skewed distribution and it doesn't look multimodal, I can use a finite K Gaussian mixture model to estimate that. So for instance, if I had some distribution and it looks something like this, and I didn't know what it is. By the way, if you did see a distribution like this, what would you be thinking? Probably gamma. So gamma or some sort of a chi-squared. There is a thing that I know where people use a log chi-squared distribution. So if I take the log, it's chi-squared. Say e to the chi-squared, it shows up in stochastic volatility models. So if you do finance, that might be something that you're familiar with. The air term is this log chi-squared divided by two distribution. It's kind of a weird thing. And one of the, the fastest Gibbs sampling techniques I know is to use a seven-component mixture model, normal mixture model, to estimate that. So I could have some you know, normals in here. And when I blend over them, it ends up the superposition looks roughly like that. And so you're just kind of thinking of the symmetry of the normal distribution and the normality of it. And so in this sense, you're kind of thinking the normal acts as a good basis function, something that I can kind of click together and build something out of. So like Legos. So anyway, um, the normal thing is nice. Um, oftentimes, I do do Cauchy stuff. A lot of times, if I'm doing something and I don't want to do the full Dirichlet process stuff, a lot of times I'll let all the components be normal, and then I'll have this Cauchy component at the end. I call it the Cauchy net. So it's not a thing outside of my research group. We do it all the time, though. And recently, we were awarded some best papers for it. So and it's a small trick. And so the world needs to kind of get away from normal stuff, and I've shown you a trick in this class that you can always apply that. OK. Um, <coughs> Okay, let's just review what this is. So a K component finite mixture model. This looks like this. one cap K. I've got these mixture probabilities. These are numbers between zero and one, and all of them add up to one. And then I have some sort of a sampling distribution. And I could let all of these presumably be different. So I have X's, and I have some parameter set. And this could be high dimensional. There could be a whole bunch of parameters in there. So if it were a normal distribution, it would have the mu and the sigma. Maybe they have different sigmas and different mu's for each of them, but maybe the parametric family is the same. And in that case, I just suppress that notation. So you know the Gaussian mixture model. And again, this is going to be the finite one, is just where you end up. I'll say Xi's come from this, Xi's come from <coughs> this sum, cap K, pi K, and then you have this normal density, and I'll, I'll write it out. 2 pi, e to the minus 1 half, X is minus mu squared, and maybe these means change, <coughs> and possibly you let the, the sigmas change as well. So you could do that. And you've got a lot of flexibility for this. You've got to get rid of that. And I say they all have the same variance in there. I don't often do that. I usually don't think my clusters have the same variability. 
So anyway, uh, this is what we studied before. I'll kind of get rid of that right there. But you get the idea. If you think there's more parameters in there, you throw them in. Question is, is how do you decide which model is better? So let me just ask that as a precursor. I'll try to answer that when I discuss what do you do if you don't know K. But if I had two model fits, how would you compare them? So I do two things, how do you compare which one is better? That's what makes you a statistician or an engineer or a scientist, is you can decide. You've got metrics for comparing. So if you can't, that's what makes you strapped to your desk all night long while your boss comes in and says, did you get the report done? So tell me what I want to know, I'll make all the decisions. So let me ask you guys again, how do you decide? Maybe a Bayes factor, yeah, that's a good answer. So maybe you use a Bayes factor between these two things. If I were looking at a K component finite mixture model and it was normal, I could work out that Bayes factor analytically because I could do all the integrations. I've shown you how to integrate over mu, I've shown you how to integrate over sigma, and so you could work out that Bayes factor. So yeah, that's a good idea. Um, which priors, of course, you'd need to think about, but base factor is a good answer. Anybody have any other answers? What's the, the difficulty in a base factor in general? It's doing the integration, right? So there are computational approaches to doing these integrations. So I have my favorite papers that review 10 different techniques on computing base factors. Something called reversible jump that you could use for deciding what K is, I hate that technique because I can never set up the right proposals. I do have my own paper on it, on how I would do it, but it's a cumbersome technique. Um, there's important sampling techniques that I do like for doing this. So there's all these computational analogs to everything. It's here's what I want to do, and then I get the computational tool to do it. And the more of these things you code up, you can apply to your research in the future. And you can climb that tree even higher, and then you know, never have to sit in a cube in your life. Something like that. That's the problem with sitting there. Um, anybody else have any other techniques? Base factors, let's say the, the integration was prohibitively difficult and you didn't have the time to investigate all these different techniques for doing these integrations. Maybe you do in the future, but you've got to do something tomorrow. Norms? What's that? You the norms? Yeah, maybe some distance norms. So maybe you come up with distance norms that make sense. So in K means, they often employ like the MSE or something like that. And in that case, it makes sense. So, so maybe some distance norms, but of course, coming up with the right distance is always a question. So if you didn't want to answer the question and come up with a distance norm, what might you do if you were a Bayesian? Likelihoods. So I like the likelihood function. The likelihood function is always a, a measure of distance. And if I take the minus log likelihood ratio between two models, which is the deviance function, there's a two that shows up in front of that, if you think of it the way I do. But if you look at 10 different packages on deviance functions, they probably have slightly different variants. You've got to be careful. So maybe log likelihood ratios. So it's kind of a good approximator of maybe a base factor. And if I want it to be even closer, I'd cut that penalty term in there, where I might say minus two log likelihood ratios to devious function plus some penalty. And BIC and AIC have different penalties. I usually like the BIC one. It approximates the base factor if everything is uniform. So I've got to be careful about the assumptions. So sometimes you can speed up your computation with good theory and understand how things kind of align with each other. Okay, so I could probably decide between two different models if I had normal and something different. I could look at the log likelihood ratio um, and decide if they're close to each other. If that thing's roughly zero or something small, I think the models are equally competitive, and I'd probably use the model that was similar in those cases. So we can always make these decisions. So here's a Gaussian mixture model, and here's our Give sampler for estimating from this. So just keep in mind what I had done is I had said there's a ZI 
in here, and I let it be equal to k. I never actually touched this variable per se. It doesn't actually kind of show up in my model. The zi, it's not part of this, for instance. So I might call this normal x given mu sigma squared. And then I might have this z right in here telling me which component number I come from. But there's a k. Maybe I'll keep the k in there. Why not? So there's this k, and I would just be saying, hey, there's a k right here. It's kind of redundant to put that in. But if I'm trying to figure out which x is associated with which z, and I'm trying to do Bayes' theorem, I know this model, x given z, and I want to flip it around and do z given x. And so sometimes the notation is helpful in us understanding how to apply Bayes' theorem. And so if I get the right notation, then everything just falls through as a formula. So, and I think that's the key step right here. So here's my give sampler. So 4t goes from 1 to some large number, and I run it until convergence. I just really have these two steps. So, of course, I've always got this step. I've got an initialization. I've always got to decide what I initialize first, but I never put that much thought into it. I've got to be honest. Like, if my initialization was the, the biggest sticking point, I want my algorithm to run from any initial condition. So on the other hand, once I get everything to run, I probably want smart initializers so that I can cut through the burn anyway. Um, but that's just a practical thing. In terms of any theoretics or anything like that, I don't put too much thought into it. So I might initialize the mu's. So mu 1 mu2 up to mu k. And if I didn't know the sigma, I would initialize that as well. So I'll assume that we know sigmas in this. So if I didn't know them at the end of the day, I would have this Gibbs update that would come from a gamma. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first learn the labels. So I would call these maybe if I were using a different terminology, I'd call them Here's the component right here. I could call it the label, something like that. So if I knew what the labels were, that's kind of the machine learning speed that you, know, that you would normally hear. I would use those and I would train under them. Instead, we're going to have to learn. So learn the labels, CIs. So how do I do it? I just sample them from their distribution right there. So I'm going to take zi. So for each one of these, i goes from 1 to n. i goes from 1 to n. And that's how many data points we have right here. I'm just going to take zi's. And I'm going to get them from its posterior distribution. We'll write out what this is in a second. So I'll call that pi z. And the thing it's conditional on, just to be a little bit more explicit, last time I just wrote straight line, but there's only a few things that each one of these depends on. And so it only depends on xi, because that's the only thing that I need to know given all of the mu's. But then I need to know all the other mu's. So I need to know mu1 to mu k. I also know the sigmas, but I'm assuming that they're known, so I usually don't write it into my notation if I know. So we'll just keep this simple. So what are your zi's again? How the zi's are the labels themselves. So let's just walk through this. If I'm sampling right here, here's what I'm going to do: is I'm going to flip a coin, a k-sided coin with those probabilities. So to sample these right here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first sample my z's. Z is going to be a number 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to cap K. And it's going to come from a multinomial. And it's going to have these associated probabilities, pi 1 to pi K. This is just a K-sided coin flip. So multinomial of um, two categories is a binomial distribution. So this is that 
wonky Dungeons and Dragons dice. So it's got weird sides on it, and you can calibrate it. You can do this on the computer pretty easily. Okay. So I'm going to first flip a coin. So I wrote this out. Is this is going to be the probability that zi is equal to k. So this is zi, this thing right here. This is f of x given whatever its components are. I'll say all of its parameters are theta k. That's my capital theta. So in our case, it would be mu k. And if we did it, no sigma, sigma k. And then I'm also going to have zi is equal to k. So really, this is a joint sampling. I sample what the z is, and then I plug it into here, and I sample the x. So to be able to generate the x's, I first need to generate the z's. But at the end of the day, I'm going to throw away the z's and say you don't get to see them. You don't get to see the, the mechanism that causes the grouping. You have to learn it. So the zi's, I'm going to first sample that multinomial. If all of a sudden I flipped it, and this was a 2, i.e. the probability mass pi 2 was relatively high, probably, and I landed on that side. Then I'm going to come to the second mixture component, and I'm going to sample the x out of that. Got it. So if you got a bunch of 2s, you would sample the second one. That's right. So xi is going to come from whatever this is, might be a normal, we'll write it in as a normal, x given mu k, I'm going to say zi right here if you'd like, sigma zi if you didn't know the sigmas. So I'm just going to grab those out of there. So I'm just indicating which mean and which variance. So which one of those modes my sampling and x out of. Does that make sense? Yeah, but we aren't learning the pi we, we decided. We're going to learn them eventually. Okay. So um, what you do at the end of the day after I do this, every time, um, however many of these z's is equal to one of the component numbers, that's an estimate of pi. Yeah. And as I keep just circulating through this algorithm, I'm going to get a distribution of pi's. So I'm going to carry along the posterior distribution of the pi's, and I don't even need to really calculate them. So I didn't talk about them because they're not necessary. I don't use them for anything in the algorithm. But I could learn them as well. So they're along for the ride. So here's what this distribution looks like. So the pi z, and I'll say is equal to k. I'll plug this in as zi if you'd like. Given my xi, because it's the only informative thing in the presence of all of the mu's, mu1 to mu k. Let's write out Bayes' theorem real clearly. This looks like f of xi given theta k. I'll put this in the context of normality in just a second. Given my zi right here is equal to k times my probability that zi is equal to k. Right here. We're going to have to come up with this prior. Now, I have to express this exactly the same, and technically these are different things. So this should be my prior right here. So I'm going to call it pi prior, just to distinguish it. Pi zi is equal to k. And we have the ability to decide how we want to take that prior. Some people might take it as their posterior estimate at every step, but you're not supposed to change a prior into your posterior in every step. It would preserve where the modes are, but it's going to underestimate your uncertainty about everything. Your prior shouldn't be changing all the time. So, and this will look like this. K goes from 1 to cap K. Fxi given theta K. Zi over the Ks. And then I got my prior. Zi is equal to K. If I knew something about the um, weight of each one of these mixture components. Maybe I was doing some scientific problem, and I, I was studying some, some groupings, and I noticed that one of the groups 
is very dominant compared to another group, I might reflect that through my prior. So let's do a, let's do a basic example. If I were trying to group two things, maybe spam or not spam. So two category thing, which one is it? This is a clustering problem, it's just like this. People use all kinds of different algorithms to solve that problem. They might even do something like this, although I know it's not the best thing going. Um, at least in terms of the, the mixture of components being normal, you probably wouldn't do that. Um, I, you, it depends on who you are, but do you get more spam or do you get more real emails? And then, of course, what's the risk of throwing one away over the other? It's kind of imbalanced, and I probably wouldn't use 50-50 in that case. So I probably, I think it's a bigger error if one of my real emails gets to my spam filter versus the other way around. So saying that, I get a lot more spams than I get real emails. So I roughly get about 100 real emails a day. I answer about half of them. And my spam filter has thousands of emails in it every day. So it's because I work at a university. If you stick around long enough, it'll happen to you too. So we're always under attack, you know? So, okay. Anyway, um, so you have a little bit of liberty on how to deal with this. Probably the default choice would be pi prior on zi is equal to k, it's probably going to be equal to 1 over k. This would be your non-informative prior. If I had information, I would use it. I would inject it, depending on the nature of the problem. How much, how many people or whatever objects are in each group. So this is Bayes' theorem. This just flips everything around. So that's everything I've already taught you. You might say, oh, the prior shouldn't it be conditional on all, like the theta case. It's conditionally independent of them. I wouldn't know how to use that information to encode my prior. So I'm kind of writing this down as it's conditionally independent of the mu's, and that's implied because I'm saying that's equal to this. So that's Bayes' theorem. And it's kind of neat. I see a lot of people apply this, and they don't call it Bayes. They call it something else. And that's totally fine. And in the early part of my career, I, I would sit there and I'd nitpick them. And I'd go, isn't that really Bayes? Isn't it Bayes? It's Bayes, right? <laughs> and it, 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 I, I don't think I want any friends doing that. <laughs> so nowadays, I feel like if you have a different thing, you call it. Just as long as you do it, it's a good idea. So I see a lot of people plug this in. They cancel right here. The 1 over k on everything. And they'll just write down the ratio of the density compared to its normalized density. And in the machine learning literature, I see that called the responsibility index. So it's the Bayesian posterior update. I don't really care what you call it. So it's a lot of psychology when it comes to humans on what you call things and why you do it. Okay. Yeah, so then that's what we're going to do. So we're going to, this is zi is equal to k right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute all these probabilities and then we're going to sample out of the multi. -number. So here's what we'll do. I'll just take my z i and I'll sample it from the multinomial distribution. So my notation over here is I'm just sampling z from its posterior, and here's how you compute every probability in that multinomial. So multinomial, I'll write it down here. Usually people put it over to the right-hand side, but let's just call this pi zi is equal to 1, and I'll suppress my notation right here. Pi zi is equal to 2 given everything else. We're going to use an idea very similar to this when we get to Dirichlet processes, and that's why we're going to be really going to think about this. The I is equal to count. So I just compute all those probabilities, and then I do the, the point flip. 
can be done really quickly. So you can compute all these probabilities in parallel if you wanted to, if you had a lot of components. Uh, it'd save you a little bit of time and then you do that. Flip the point. You learn your Z's. And you do that for each one of these. Then the next step is exactly what I taught you in the early part of the class. Given you know which X's came from which components, then you just use those X's to infer the parameters for that component. In our case, it's mu. So our second step here is learn mu. So at this step right here, you're going to have a vector of n z's, and they're going to be numbers between 1 and cap k. So then you're just going to learn the mu k's. So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to just take mu k. And I'm going to do this for k goes from 1 to cap k. And I'll learn my mu case. I'll say this. And I probably should put some labels on here and say t right here. That's just the iteration of my Gibbs sampler. So I can store everything so I can monitor convergence. We gotta store something so we can see if we converge. But the mu case, they're gonna come from pi mu k. Given the exit, and this is kind of always true, I write in the sigma k right here, if you'd like. But I'm not gonna use any old x's. I'm gonna use the x's, I'll write real big here such that the x i's came from a pairing with z i is equal to k. So that's my notation right here. And I might make that a little bit cleaner and just say these are my x that came from zi's are equal to k. I go from 1 to n right here. So it's just those x's. So the hardest part of this is just changing the dimension of that matrix. Peter? Um, should the first inner for loop be from k to k? This one right here? Yeah. This one goes for n because think about the dimensionality of the z's. Z's go from 1 to N. Okay, it's a label for each point. For each point. Right. Yeah, every point has its own label. Gotcha. How, um, another follow-up question. How do you determine uh, cap K? Yeah, good question. So that's why I put it right there. What if you don't know cap K? Uh, okay. So let me just answer your question real quickly since we've already dived into that. If I had two model fits, so what I might do, this would be my cheapest thing to do. Uh, is I would run it for various cap k. And then what I might do is look at my total likelihood function, and I would make a plot that looked like this. So this might be my likelihood. Keep in mind what the likelihood looks like. It's going to be I goes from 1 to n, just like always. We've got this conditional independence right here. And then I'm going to have these n xi's right here, that normal thing. I'm going to have mu k right here. This would have my t in here. I'd have my sigma k. If I needed to learn that, I'd put a t on that as well. I'd do this. But I need to indicate which one of these are on, which component am I in. Probably the easiest thing to do would take the zi and check to see if it's equal to k in my sampler. So this is just acting as a switch. If zi wasn't k, then I wouldn't have that thing in here, right here. But what I'd probably do is I'd have k goes from 1 to cap k. 
I just want to point out in this inner product right here, the interior product, only one of these is not one. So when this gets raised to a zero power, it's a one. And so I'm producting through by a one. So how many terms are there in this product right here? There's really only n non-trivial terms. There's a whole bunch of one terms. So basically, I'm just taking my component that I think at every step in here, and I probably have this down at the very bottom. So right here at that one, not at the end of that one. And I would just compute my likelihood evaluation at every step of my GIF sampler. And I would run that, and I'd run that. And so then what I would probably do is I'd look at how well this thing fit for k was equal to 1. So this will be k right here. And then I would look at my posterior fit. And maybe I make a box plot of that. If you don't like making box plots and you don't like thinking about uncertainty, I do. I think that's the whole answer. You could just take the average. Something like that. And you could plot that. Just the average point. The box plot is the inner quartile range. And there's some whiskers. And I would tell you what they are, but then the software package you use probably uses something different. In Stat 101, they teach you 1.5 times the inner quartile range. I rarely see software package actually do that. All kinds of other things. And then I do it for k is equal to 2. So, and maybe I would look at what its likelihood is right here. And then I maybe look at this right here. And then maybe I'd look at that, I'd look at that, I'd look at that, I'd look at that. So I'd see it's kind of increasing. And so maybe I would say, well, maybe that's the one right here. If I keep adding components to it, you probably know as you add more and more parameters to something, the fit gets better. That's always true. You have more degrees of freedom to fit to. And so I probably don't want to start just adding a lot of components. I'm not getting much of a better fit. So you would probably be a little bit bothered by this right here if it were that flat. And what you're usually hoping for is that your plots look something like that. So there's a real kink in there. Sometimes you'll hear people call this an elbow plot. I've heard it called a knee plot. And then the technical term is scree plot. S-C-R-E. So this is the screen plot. So I'm curious about the posterior distribution of this numbers. Okay. So these are just numbers that we have some to They're arbitrary labels. We call them one, two, three, four. But the ordering doesn't make any difference. So This formula. That's a number. That's specifically how we plug it in. So what I take right here for these, if it were the normal thing, I'm just taking 1 over 2 pi, sigma k, I guess I'm like that, e to the minus 1 half x i minus mu k squared over sigma k. So as intuitively, you're just checking to see how close this xi is to mu k. And if all the sigmas were different, then it would be a relative difference where it's relative to sigma. So it's really just checking this distance, but it's encoding it as a probability, which kind of has some advantages. And I'll show you one of those in a second. Any other questions? All good questions. OK, let me show you what the k-means algorithm is. This was the first clustering tool that I learned. I thought it was really cool. It like blew my mind. And what blew my mind about it is that it was an algorithm. I couldn't write down a mathematical equation to express what I was doing. It was a process. They used mathematics inside of it, but it was kind of neat. I couldn't tell you by working through a, a formula what the answer would be. I'd need to do this iterative scheme, and I think that that's a really cool thing. So sometimes you can't write down things mathematically, but you can use your computer to iterate through ideas and do a lot of comparisons for you. 
So this is what k means. Let me just query you real quick. Who already knows what this algorithm is, or at least has heard about it? And that's what I thought. Cool. So you can keep me on track. So k means it's very similar to this, but I'll show you where it can fail. So k means again, they use um, a distance metric at the end of the day. I'll show you what the distance metric is, but it's just mean squared error, essentially. So what we're going to do is we're going to initialize and just like this algorithm right here, I have my choice what I can initialize. I can either initialize all of the labels, and there are labels in this, and we're going to call them Z's, although I think on Wiki they probably don't call them Z's. So, but that will be our labels. We're going to initialize what our means look like. In the key means algorithm, they call them centroids. Centroids are means. Okay, so, so we're going to initialize the means. But if you're just trying to match the literature, we'll call them centroids. I think I learned this term first in physics where they were trying to tell me the center of mass of something. That is the mean. It's the expectation. So the means, so I'm just going to come up with these again. Mu1, mu2, out to mu k. They probably call them C's or something like that if you're looking on Wikipedia, but it's going to be the exact same thing. And then I'm just going to run through each data point and I'm going to see which one is closest. So for each data point, I goes from 1 to n. We're going to look at this function. I'm going to look at xi minus mu k. And that'll be for my current mu k. So if you'd like, I could throw this into a loop and track everything. I don't think they normally do this. We usually don't store everything, but there's no reason we can't do that. So I'm just going to look at this thing, this square distance. If it were a higher dimension, so I've been playing around with the x's or lower dimension. So in high D, look at xi minus mu k in the 2 norm. Okay, so what this would look like is something like this xi minus mu k, here's maybe the first dimension of it, square it out, plus xi, the second dimension, minus mu k2, square that thing out. I don't care if you take the square root over the top, it doesn't need to be there, that's a monotonic function, but basically you're just going to compare all these two norm distances. I call it mean squared error, same sort of thing. So I'm just going to look at this distance i right here. But I'm going to do it for all of the different k's. So I'm going to look at 4 k goes from 1 to cap k. And I'm going to compare all of these um, k's right here. And I'll compare all of those to each other. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select zi. Let me just write down these n's. So I'm going to take zi just to match our notation. Zi is going to be, and I'll just write it out in words, the label that minimizes, that I'll say, that has the smallest di1, di2, all the way up to dik. And I could give you some notation for that. And I found that that notation usually can 
confuses people the first time they see it if I write it in the secondary notation. So I'll just leave it just like this. So I'm going to compute all these distances, and then I'm going to take zi right here, which is associated with xi, the i data point, and I'm just going to look at the smallest one of these d's. So if this was the smallest out of this collection, then I would take this to be 2. It would be the second one in the list. At the end of this, so after we do that, so I'll say end, end, there's an end here. After this, at the end of it, we're going to update all of our centers, our means, our centroids. So I'm going to take all of my x's, and I'm going to take the average of them for each one of the labels. So I'm going to look at four. K goes from 1 to half K. I'll do this for each one of the centers. And I'll just re-update all of these things. So mu K is going to be equal to the sum of the Xi's such that the Xi has ZI is equal to K. So that's my notation that I used last time. My XI is associated such that the ZI that I just got here is equal to K. And then I'm going to have some associated number of those. I'll call it NK. So this is going to be my number of XI's that are associated with ZI is equal to K. I'll recycle that notation that I came up with last time. And I'll divide by NK right here. So I just take the average of all of those. And then we do it again. And we do it again. And we do it again. And we do it again. So, and it will converge. It doesn't necessarily converge to the global maximum, or at least the minimizer of the total MSE. But I can do the exact same thing for this algorithm that I can do over here, where I can look at my total MSE, where I'm comparing my XI's to the mu K's, and I can add them all up, all of those squared terms. You can normalize it if you want. It won't make any difference. It's just summing up n different points. Each one of them is going to be assigned to one of the clusters. So I'm just looking on average how close they are to their associated mu K's. And I could store all this, put a T on there, If you'd like to track everything and see how it converged, it's not quite as necessary in this case, because we don't have this necessary notion of ergodicity and stationarity like we do in a Gibbs sampler. Let me just finish saying what I'm saying. We'll be done in just a second, and I'll open it up for questions. But really, these are very similar steps. They look about the same. One's probabilistic, one's not probabilistic. Let me show you where k-means can fail. So I just want to point out, in this step right here, I'm not really using any probability to guide it. I'm just saying which one is closest, and I'm just taking this greedy thing. Whatever is the best one right now, I'm just going to take that, and nothing else has a chance. But if I just think about an example, this is k means failing. might be something like this. Let's just think about two clusters. I'm going to draw them in two dimensions. I'm going to think about two clusters that look like this. So I've got a whole bunch of down points in here. Here's the center. I'll call this mu1. This mu2, that's that center right there. K means it's just looking to see who's closest to which center. So let's imagine I take that, that's about the middle right there. And let's just think about this. If I have a point just right off to the right hand side of the middle, so this is my bisector. 
k-means is going to assign this point right here to which one of these clusters? To that one, because it's closer. Which one would you assign it to? To this one. That's right. Why? Because the variance is bigger. It's a wider distribution. Now you can fix all that up. And you could try to learn what the sigma k's were and have some sigma k here squared. And so, and in high dimension, we call this like a Mihalanovis distance, and we can compute this empirically from the data so I can look at my variance. So here we try to estimate a mean. I can compute an empirical variance from all of my, um, given all of my z's. And I could do that sort of thing, but k means is still, even if I did that and I controlled for the, these two different variances, it's still going to be a greedy, really hard, fast rule. So if I had something that was just over to the right-hand side on the relative distance, it's always going to that same group. Where in Bayes, by picking a probabilistic rule, if I had something that was explained maybe with 51% probability or 49% probability, the Bayesian's going to average over those two answers. And that's another thing that I know that is a good analytics principle. Uncertainty should always be averaged over, and Bayesians do that for free. But being a Bayesian gives you auto averaging, and it also gives you this soft thresholding of probabilities. Those are all good ideas. So if you compete against somebody in a data competition that doesn't do that, you're very likely to beat them. So on average. Okay, I think that's it right now. Uh, Patrick, you got a question? Uh, I just you would do the ZI for comparison after you computed all your ZIs for that k value, right? Yeah, so I, compare, I would compute all of these. Oh, I see what you're saying. I needed to run this inside of that. Yes. So I need to compute those before I can make a comparison. Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, we'll come back next time and we'll ask, what do you do if you don't know k? We've answered that a little bit. I can build a screen plot for k means, do the same sort of thing, but I'll show you how to do something probabilistic so that it's all built into one model. That's the nearest way process. Let me hand back some homework. Caleb?